Hello everybody, my name is Rami Tamimi and I will be presenting on evaluating the accuracy of multi-return on the DJI L2 um, in comparison to terrestrial scanning. A little bit about me, uh, I am a professional surveyor and a PhD student at The Ohio State studying geodetic engineering under the direction of Dr. Charles Toth. I'm um, also the founder and head instructor of the survey school and I kind of create surveying and geospatial technology videos on YouTube. We've got a pretty decent sized following so I'm um, definitely very passionate about this industry and what it has to offer. So for this research uh, we actually it's a part of a research project that we are working on for ISPRS uh, and so the data set you see here is actually um, collected by the DJI um, M350 RTK with the L2 LiDAR sensor. While we were doing the research for this project and evaluating its accuracy over a large uh, plot of land, we were noticing that, you know, the multi-returns that come out of this sensor, you know, really should be studied as well. Um, the first return and the fifth return are, you know, very different in terms of the accuracy that we can get. Um, many of the first returns end up at the top of trees, but we do see some on the ground. Uh, but most of those later returns are on the ground. And so um, how accurate is it, especially if we're trying to map out terrain and we're trying to create, you know, a terrain model, you know, can we trust those later returns? So our objective was to basically segment the different returns that come out of the L2 LiDAR sensor uh, and then compare it to terrestrial scanning. So we opted to use the Leica P40 uh, laser scanner um, as our ground truth data set. Being that it's on the ground, we're able to actually measure the ground uh, and get a large amount of points that we can then compare. So what you see in the middle here in, well, the colors are quite distorted, but in yellow is the um, L2 and then in the white is the uh, terrestrial scanner. And so the, the study area, um, you know, it's again quite large. <laughs> you know, use a terrestrial scanner and scan out the entire city. So we focus on a small area here. Um, this is, I would say, approximately two to three acres. It's located in Utica, Michigan. And this area in the entire data set from the L2 uh, has a lot of tree coverage. There's a big metal bridge. Uh, so we figured that this is probably the most challenging area for uh, UAS LiDAR and this would be a great place to actually study it. Um, you may notice on the right where the terrestrial scan is that this was collected in February and there is snow on the ground, so I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but the UAS flight took place in the fall of 2024, so a little bit better weather conditions. Um, again, this was not a project that we anticipated doing, but it kind of came out of other research that we were working on. So some specifications that come out of the L2, um, it has a maximum range of 450 meters, which is beyond the FAA legal limit, but that's quite nice that it can get that much data. DJI claims an accuracy level of two centimeters at 150 meters above ground level. Um, like I mentioned before, there are five returns. So you really are getting a lot of data, um, even in really forested areas. Um, you're gonna be getting quite a bit of um, sampling on the ground. It generates about 240 thousand points per second and uh, the field of view I mean for what we're doing we usually shoot it in nadir so we get plenty of coverage um, I'll go over the flight specifications in a moment but uh, overall like this is a sensor that many people are using now given its lower costs and ease of use um, you know traditional UAS lidar mapping was much more difficult so it's really becoming popular especially in the surveying industry and so that brings us to the p40 which has a max range of 270 meters an accuracy of 1.2 two millimeters over a range of 10 meters of mapping. It does give only one single return, but that's okay. We're on the ground, so that's the only return we want. Uh, and it generates a million points per second. So lots and lots of uh, points to work with. So the M350, when we flew it, uh, we flew it at 260 feet above ground level. Uh, we had 40% overlap and at a speed of 11 miles per hour. Uh, we connected to the Michigan Department of Transportation's CORS network to get RTK corrections. We also had an inward reach RS3 on site that we were running, um, you know, logging, you know, just uh, raw data that we would then did PPK corrections on just to ensure that if we lost RTK at any point that we could update our trajectories to ensure we have the best data possible. Uh, we used DJI Terra to process this and if anyone's used DJI Terra, you know that you can only use the controls in the vertical direction. So we only have nine vertical control points. Um, I don't have a visual here. Um, this was spread out across the large uh, downtown site. 
So uh, we just, like I said, we just took that small area of the site, which was 28 million points. So I think the overall site had like 200 or 300 million points. Uh, but the overall, the 200, 300 million point data set had an RMSE error with the control of 0.1 feet. So a tenth of a foot, we find that to be quite acceptable. These were the points that we used and here are the individual um, errors that we had with each point after we used it to georeference the vertical component of the data set. Now, when it came to the P40, uh, we definitely needed to establish ground control, um, and we used, you know, horizontal and vertical ground control. So I used the Leica GSO5 to just take GNSS observations using RTK, uh, and we set up seven control points, and we wanted at least one of those points to be uh, connected to the three scans that we would be doing. So we have three scan stations, um, and that point number one is the one point that is relevant to all of them. And then we set two control points additional to um, that number one. So we had a total of seven points. All of our 3D qualities were within six hundredths of a foot. I know that doesn't really mean much if there's a ton of multipathing, which you will see there is with a huge metal bridge and a bunch of trees in the way. Uh, but we were doing our best to establish you know, redundancy with our control. We set it all up, everything is good. Um, there was snow on the ground, it was February, and this was the only time I was able to get a scanner in my hands. So um, we, I would say anticipate about a, a tenth to two tenths of a foot of snow coverage, um, but we'll go over the discussions, you know, how that affected the data. So the accuracy of the P40, this is after we've combined the points together and after we've actually uh, brought the three scan worlds together. The first thing we want to do is bring the scan worlds together to see what the relative accuracy is. And between scan worlds one and two and two and three, we were within two hundredths of a foot. So that tells us that our relative accuracy is quite good. Um, as I set up multiple times, we had a lot of points that were matching up. So the overlap was good and that gave us a pretty good data set that we could work with. Now, when we brought in the ground control points to get our absolute accuracy, it ranged, right? The best was five hundredths of a foot, which is really, really nice, but the worst was three tenths. And that was point number one, which was next to a bridge and there was tons of trees in the area. So I anticipate that point wasn't gonna give me the best accuracy. Um, so after running through all seven points, we decided we were going to use four points to fit the model best. So we used points two, seven, five, and six, and you can reference the uh, field notes that I had er on an earlier slide to see where those are located. Um, and that gave us a combined RMSC of about 900 of a foot. So it puts us right around a tenth. All right, I'm, I'm willing to work with this. It's not my favorite, but I'm willing to work with it as our ground truth data set. So when we're looking at the L2 data set, right, we've got multiple returns coming in. And it's nice because DJI Terra actually specifies what color is associated with which return. The dark blue is the first return, cyan is second, green is third, yellow is fourth, and red is fifth. And so naturally, first return, you know, it seems like it's, it's taking over, but most of those are actually tree covered areas. Um, once you get into where the actual terrain is under the trees, second and third return really dominate. And fourth and fifth return, there's a lot less points. And we'll go over the percentages of points um, based off of the point cloud. The way we compare the data, because I only have so much power with DJI Terra, is that I had to pick points manually. So I picked between 10 and 20 points for each return. Again, I can visually see which point comes from which return. Um, and so I just picked the points that correlated to a point that was within 5 hundredths of a foot with the laser scanner and just used the nearest neighbor to establish what the vertical difference is between the two data sets. And the first return had about 15% of the points. Um, this is coming from the 28 million points that are from the segmented area of the L2. And we uh, overall had about 9 hundredths of a foot, which is quite nice. So uh, a minimum of, you know, 3 hundredths, which is like right on, and then a maximum of about 5 tenths or sorry, 15 hundredths. Um, so our overall RMSE was 0 0.94. And the second return had about half of the points. So most of the returns we got underneath the trees were coming from that second return. It had about 13 hundredths of a foot in RMSE. Um, tw about a quarter of the remaining returns came from the third. Uh, we start to hit two tenths. And then the fourth actually only had about 5% of the data. So most of those points were already used up. Uh, but when evaluating the points from the fourth return, we had uh, a quarter of a foot. And when we got to the fifth return, we were almost at three tenths. What this tells us is that obviously the earlier returns give us better accuracy. And by the time you get to the third, fourth, and fifth return, you start to lose that accuracy. So um, by how much? 
In this particular project, we experienced between 25 hundredths and 3 tenths of a foot. Uh, so it's not terrible for a lot of applications. This is quite acceptable. You can trust the data, you know, at the fourth and fifth return. Um, and of course, there are filters that will let you smooth out the data. So it'll actually try to help uh, improve the accuracy um, by mimicking the first and second return points. Um, to improve this project, I think we definitely want to run a, um, a least squares adjustment on the control points. I want to run a traverse with a total station, maybe when it's not snowing and cold outside. Um, and that way I will have better control so we won't have to pick only four of the points for the terrestrial scanner. And additionally, not do it in the snow. Do it when the weather is optimal. And so we'll have a better terrestrial LiDAR scan uh, data set that we can work with. And instead of selecting 10 to 20 points, I would love to have the ability to actually take all of the points that come out of those returns from the DJI Terra software and create like a DEM that I can then use to get more points to sample rather than me just picking 20 random points. And so that's it. Uh, I wanna thank the sponsors and my advisor for helping me with this project. Um, without you guys, we would not be able to accomplish this. And with that, Thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions.